Some talk about how to read a tree, how to construct a tree, some of the traits of good trees. Let's talk about kind of the power behind these trees and all of the things that we can learn from constructing phylogenetic trees. So we're going to go through a few examples here of things that we've learned through constructing these phylogenies. So phylogenies can help us infer the features of a common ancestor. So this example here we're looking at whales. So whales are mammals, right? Um, and for a long time we weren't totally sure how whales were related to the rest of mammals. It was very unclear. It's kind of this big black box in biology, kind of like, eh, they're mammals. They have all the characteristics of mammals. They have mammary glands. They have scabutaneous fat, right? They give by birth. They have all those key characteristics, but how do they really fit in here? We don't really know. But DNA analysis, like we talked about before, looking at the homolo homologies in DNA, has shown us that they're actually most closely related. Whales are most closely related to hippos of all things. But if you kind of think about it, right, hippos already kind of live mostly in the water, so it's not that much of a stretch to see that they, one branch of hippos, many millions of years ago, may have branched off and gone another trajectory, living only in the water. And then, and then we get whales, right? So we know that hippos are part of a group called even-toed ungulates. So ungulates are uh, hooved animals that bear their weight on just two of their, their toes, right? Deer would be another even-toed un ungulate. Giraffes, camels, elk, things like that. So looking at this phylogeny, we can infer some characteristics of the ancestor that hippos and whales shares and the ancestor that hippos share with other even-toed ungulates. So let's take a basic characteristic, like having four legs, being a tetrapod, right? Hippos and whales are sister taxa, Hippos have four legs, and the other group of ungulates has four legs too, so we can infer that the common ancestor that hippos and whales share, as well as the common ancestor that hippos and whales share with other ungulates, probably also had four legs. Right? Remember that idea of parsimony? So, there was probably one point in time a form of a whale that still had four legs. Right? And fossil evidence has confirmed this idea that we first hypothesized through this genetic analysis. We can also use phylogenies to help us predict um, behaviors or metabolic processes of organisms. So especially, this is especially cool when we think about characteristics that don't fossilize. You can't fossilize a behavior really, or you can't fossilize molecules and in being in, be able to interpret how the physiology of an organism was, right? But we can hypothesize, we can kind of guess based on the characteristics of the organisms that are in that tree as well. So here we have um, kind of a simplistic phylogenetic tree of reptiles, including birds. Never birds are kind of that group that's part of the reptile clade, but not really reptiles. So we were curious for a long time if dinosaurs were brooders, meaning did they sit on their eggs and did they take care of their eggs? So we know that crocodiles are brooders, they take care of their eggs. We know that birds are brooders and they take care of their eggs. And based on the phylogenetic analysis that we've done, we know that birds and dinosaurs, these two groups right here, are very closely related together. And the fact that crocodiles and birds share that characteristic of brooding, it evolved back here, we could put that trait right here. We can then guess that it's most likely that dinosaurs were also brooders, right? If that trait evolved back here, it would have been inherited by the lineages that arose from that ancestor. Cool, huh? We can infer information about the behavior of dinosaurs based on where different traits are all arose in the phylogeny. Phylogenies are also helpful in speeding up the development of medicines in the face of a pandemic or in the face of maybe an antibiotic resistant bacteria, right? So let's say we have we know that these viruses are related, okay? We have established how they're related, virus 2 and 3 being sister taxa, right? 
4, 3, and 2 all being one clade, one monophyletic clade, right? And let's say a new virus arises, we sequence its genetic information, and we find that it's a sister taxa to virus 1. So we know virus 1 responds to, let's say, medicine C, that it's Medicine C helps to treat this virus, this viral infection, this virus is, is sensitive to that medicine. These viruses over here are sensitive to other medicines. So if we figure out how these viruses are related, what medicine do you think we would try first to treat this virus? So based on the evolutionary relationships, we can infer what this virus might be sensitive to based on its relatedness to other viruses. We can also use a really cool tool called a molecular clock to scale trees based on time to estimate when traits arose, specifically give a range of maybe 15 million years ago this trait arose, and when lineages split. When was the last time these lineages shared a common ancestor? So this all relies again on this idea of a molecular clock. And what we do when we're looking at molecular clocks is we can estimate the average mutation rate of a gene by looking at the differences in DNA sequences and the protein sequences that result, the proteins that result from that DNA. We can infer, we can calculate one, how often mutations arise on average, and two, we can infer the sequence in which mutations arose. And then we can also use that information to estimate when species may have split. When was the last time they shared a common ancestor? So here we have two species of uh, silver swords. So these are plants, right? We find these in Hawaii. We find this species, the tarweed, here in the Pacific Nor Northwest. Using a molecular clock, we were able to figure out that that split happened about five million years ago. So using a molecular clock, we, we were able to figure out that one, the sequences let us told us that the tarweed was most closely related to these silver swords. And based on the mutation rate that we discovered in these genes that we used to investigate these species, that this split happened between tarweeds and the Hawaiian silver swords about five million years ago, and that these two species split about one million years ago. So some phylogenies might have a time scale. Be careful when you're reading these to make sure are they scaled to time or not. If they are scaled to time, that means that they've been using molecular clocks. So using phylogenetics to understand how organisms are related has caused some major shifts in how we talk about the relationship of organisms and how we talk about taxonomy as well, right? Um, I remember when I was in uh, in high school, I remember learning the five kingdom system, kingdom Monera, kingdom protista, kingdom plantae, fungi, and animalia, right? There are five kingdoms. Uh, later, I learned that there were six kingdoms. We broke Monera up into bacteria and archaea, <laughs> right? Now we have the domain system, okay? So three domains that are then broken into kingdoms. So this new information that we discover about how organisms are related to each other using morphological data, using genetics, using proteomics, helps us to reorganize and reestablish the relationship between organisms to get closer and closer and closer to reflecting their evolutionary relationships.